Hello and welcome to this CUBE Conversation. This segment is part of our pre-IPO CEO series. Arctic Wolf is a company that provides managed cybersecurity services that are designed to help companies protect their technology infrastructure from cyber attacks. It essentially serves as a security operations center for the many, many companies that don't have a SOC. Last year, Arctic Wolf expanded the scope of its security services by acquiring incident response startup Tetra Defense, the company's president and CEO Nick Schneider joins us today to share some expansion news and give us an update on the market and the company. Nick, welcome back to theCUBE, good to see you. Great to be here, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So what's new in 2023? What are some of the key milestones that you've achieved this year? Yeah, so I mean, in the last few months here, you know, we've continued to grow uh, quite a bit, uh, in particular internationally and obviously on our base here in the US. Uh, just yesterday, actually, we announced uh, the expansion of our incident response uh, services into our global customers in EMEA and ANZ, and we're excited to bring this uh, new functionality to the market, a, a functionality that we've had now in the U.S. and Canadian markets uh, for about a year and a half. Um, you know, we've added along with that uh, security operations uh, warranty to eligible customers within our within our base. Uh, which if they meet certain milestones, you know, can garner up to a $1 million uh, cybersecurity warranty. Um, we also just recently launched a new data center in, in Sydney, Australia. And I think that speaks to kind of our commitment to the customers and partners in that region. And we had done similar uh, about two years ago uh, in EMEA as well. So we continue to expand into these markets. And when we do so, we do so uh, in earnest. Um, you know, along with that, you know, I think for the second year in a row now, we've won uh, the Forbes Cloud 100, uh, which we're honored to be a part of. Uh, Gartner did uh, a peer insight uh, review recently, uh, voice of the customer on managed detection and response, and Arctic Wolf was named uh, as a leader in, in that work. Um, and we've just continued to grow and expand, you know, our customer base and the functionality and, and feature set that we bring to those customers, you know, now well over, you know, 4,000 customers globally. Uh, 2,200 employees and and working with you know over a thousand uh, trusted partners uh, throughout the globe. So so business continues to be uh, very good, um, and we continue to make strides to improve the capabilities that we have to deliver to the customer base, but also the geographies and the routes to market that we leverage to do so. Yeah, thank you. So we have some data that I want to pull up here and and share with the audience. Um, so this is from our our data partner, ETR, um, and, uh, Enterprise Technology uh, Research. And it's data from their August um, survey of emerging technology companies, e ETS e is Emerging Technology Survey. It's a survey of uh, 1,488 IT decision makers. And this is a subsector uh, within the intrusion detection and prevention space. And so on the vertical axis is net sentiment which is an indicator of intent to engage. And then the horizontal axis is mindshare, i.e. have people heard of you? And you can see the N's that your N of 571 um, divided by that 1488 informs your position that's way out to the right, kind of like a, ma a, a quantifiable Gartner magic quadrant, if you will, with obviously different dimensions. And so obviously, Nick, you're, 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 you're well known, you've raised a lot of money, uh, you're you're doing a good job here. To what do you attribute the success? Uh, it, last time we talked, it was the market was more in sort of growth mode, spend, spend, spend to deal with 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 hybrid and remote work. I, I think you've subsequently changed your strategy a little bit to fit the the current situation. Maybe more of a focus on profitability, but it seems to be working. Yeah, I mean, we're constantly paying attention to the way in which we grow and the way in which we manage the bottom line. And all the way through that is the objective of ensuring that we're delivering the outcomes to our customers and partners that we that we promise. And, and the market has evolved quite a bit. You know, over time, we, we kind of cut our teeth in the detection and response space. And, you know, that evolved in the market from XDR to managed XDR and effectively what we've done for the entirety of our existence has been, you know, managed XDR. So uh, the ability to detect and respond to threats kind of regardless of the attack surface and then being able to layer in what we call our concierge approach in a curated manner uh, to give those customers peace of mind and give those customers um, a, a voice or a conduit into the business 
uh, that can answer questions you know, of them directly with some context or business context about their environment. And kind of through that engagement with the customer, what we found uh, was a lot of those entities were looking for us to also help them understand what their vulnerabilities were. So not just detect and respond to potential incidents, but also understand their vulnerabilities ahead of time. Uh, then how do we you know, train and enable the employee base that we have, which is continuing to be one of the uh, you know, most prominent uh, vectors for attack uh, by the bad actors, uh, which kind of led into, hey, um, it would be great if uh, we could you know, leverage, and, and most of this is a non-Arctic Wolf customer, uh, incident response services uh, by a trusted leader in the space, and then uh, and then work together to improve our posture over time, which which then subsequently kind of led us into uh, engagement with the insurance community and in, in how we could leverage what we know about the market, the way in which we engage with our customers, uh, by also uh, inviting the insurance community in uh, to help a customer understand their overall risk and how the transfer of risk kind of within their environment may or may not take place. So it's been a it's been a uh, an evolution, I think, of the market in conjunction with an evolution of of kind of Arctic Wolf and the way in which we've approached it. And uh, certainly through, uh, you know, the past year and a half, uh, customers have really been looking for opportunities um, to work with a more consolidated set of vendors that can solve a broader uh, array of problems that they would typically have in a security operation. And, and that's really what we've been, you know, after from the onset of the company. I mean, you're definitely seeing the consolidation theme in <clears throat> cyber. Generally, the, the companies that have a strong story there, you know, tending, the public companies anyway, tend to, to do pretty well. At least you can see that in the, in the earnings reports. And then as part of your TAM expansion, your sort of, your, your, your news earlier today, in February 22, you acquired Tetra Defense, really bolstering your incident response. Uh, I want to talk about that news, you know, why EMEA, uh, and New Zealand, why now? You mentioned some data center activity there. It, you know, it's it, when you expand overseas, obviously it's expensive. You're, you're in that, you know, balancing with the macro, you're balancing, you know, profitability with growth. Can you talk about, you know, why Europe and or EMEA and, and, and New Zealand and why now? Yeah, so, uh, so we've been in EMEA for two plus years now. So that we've a pretty, material business uh, in that region. And that region has done phenomenally for us. So I, I would say we're kind of beyond kind of the early entry point there where uh, we're seeing, you know, really good, you know, both growth, but also, you know, growth uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, the expansion into uh, Australia, New Zealand um, was, was really around, um, you know, customer request and demand that we were seeing, you know, inbound and, you know, our desire to begin to expand into the APAC region. Uh, and I think uh, we've now been in that region for, call it six months, you know, two quarters. Uh, and already we have a pretty, you know, sizable team built out both in, in kind of the go-to-market functions, but also uh, in the functions that are there to deliver, you know, these outcomes uh, to the end user, whether it be through the technology or, or through this concierge curated approach. Um, and, and for us, um, being able to make those investments and be able to make them on top of the investments that we're making in other regions that have, you know, pretty massive scale um, is something that just makes sense for the long term um, of, of Arctic Wolf and the long term of the partnerships that we have both with our customers uh, and the, the partner community. So, um, you know, those regions have the same problems the U.S. or North America has. Uh, those regions, uh, you know, I think uh, more often than not have, have less, uh, you know, optionality with regards to who they work with. And I think uh, we had the opportunity or have the opportunity to bring, you know, a brand as we just, you know, went through on, on some of the data you showed uh, into those regions in a way that can provide uh, not just the outcome of incident response, but the outcomes of security operations wholesale to a customer base that is looking for it. So I, I think it's a a great opportunity for us. The results thus far have been uh, have been really strong, and and I would expect that we're going to continue to see the same success that we saw and, and are seeing in North America to to happen in in the other regions throughout the globe. Let's talk a little bit about the macro. Uh, obviously, it's been an interesting year. C cyber was somewhat insulated for a period of time, and then it, it it seemed to you know revert to the mean. 
it seems like it's it's continues to do well. Uh, it's obviously the number one priority. People talk about that all the time. There's many, many surveys out there, but at the same time, the overall spending climate, you know, it's been somewhat capped. And so we're seeing with the craziness, it's, we're 10 minutes in, we, we, have to, we have to now bring in AI, Nick. Um, but so you're seeing some of the AI, uptick in AI spend uh, detract from some of the other, the other budgets. As they say, cyber uh, seems to be holding up, but what are the big changes that you're seeing at the macro and then I want to get into your thoughts. I know you've, you've got some on the impact of, of Gen AI, the hype around that and some of the cautions there, but, but start with the high level. What are you seeing at the macro? Yeah, so I mean, I, I certainly think, see that, or think that we've been seeing some improvement, uh, you know, here, um, you know, especially over the last, you know, several months, I think uh, there are some macroeconomic indicators that would show uh, that we're headed on the right trajectory uh, I think there are some results, especially from some of the public, you know, lead traded companies, especially in cyber that would uh, backstop both a healthy demand environment, but also uh, a spend environment that's uh, improving. Uh, and I think with regards to cybersecurity, as you alluded to, uh, it's just an area of the, of the uh, industry or an area of a company's operation uh, where there's so much going on, there's so much new uh, and there's so much opportunity um, and and available change that um, it's it, it just can't be put on on the back burner even for a short period of time. There can be some reprioritizations in the way in which you solve the problem, which I think we saw through customers looking for uh, vendors that can solve a broader set of problems for them. But uh, but I don't think cybersecurity as a whole, you know, would move into uh, uh, position B, if you will, within kind of the overall prioritization within the company. I, I think as new trends have emerged, uh, you know, AI being the one that is most heavily talked about, um, it's been an opportunity for organizations um, to leverage that technology in a way uh, that, you know, betters them as a business or betters them, you know, with regards to their cybersecurity posture. But unfortunately, it's also been an opportunity for the bad actors. So, um, so I think while AI has come into uh, vogue kind of within the market wholesale, you know, a, AI and machine learning has played a critical role in cybersecurity for quite a while. Uh, and B, I think with the advent of some of the uh, generative AI and some of the other stuff that's that's happening within the space, there's also been an opportunity presented to the bad actors um, and and kind of the marriage of, uh, of those two opportunities is obviously driving you know, hype within within AI wholesale. So, um, so you know, I, I think the macro is you know headed in the right direction. I think AI, as it relates to cybersecurity, um, is both a benefit to organizations, but also a, a detriment because of the activity that the bad actors, uh, or or the manner in which the bad actors may leverage it. Uh, and I think you know, kind of how that all plays out is still a little bit to be seen. Uh, but one thing is for sure, it, you know, AI is here to stay. And you're going to have to leverage it, um, you know, both in your, uh, you, you know, your overall business operations, but also in the way in which you, you know, protect your organization from a cybersecurity standpoint. So two quick follow-ups on that. Um, in our July SuperCloud three event, the focus really was on cybersecurity meets meets generative AI, and one of the takeaways from that those discussions was the problem with Gen AI is it's generative. And it gives you a different answer every time. And of course we all know about the hallucinations. So the applicability to cyber, you have to be very careful about how you apply it. And as you pointed out, AI is not new. It was not like it was invented in November yeah. of 2022. Um, and certainly many you know, cyber firms, if not most, if not all have been using it, but generative AI introduces this sort of new uh, capability that uh, folks I think the consensus was we have to be very, very careful about how we actually apply it. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that we as a cybersecurity industry and as practitioners of, of uh, cybersecurity need to be very careful about the way in which generative AI, AI is used. Now, I think there are some outcomes or some opportunities that are maybe uh, less in the critical path. Uh, that you could leverage generative AI in a way that is, uh, you know, intelligent and smart, especially as that technology evolves. There are also ways that it could be leveraged that would be very dangerous for the average end user or the average vendor uh, because of uh, some of the unpredictability or because of some of the, you know, acknowledgement of, um, 
you know, potentially the wrong outcome being projected to the customer with high competence. So, um, so it's it's certainly an area of the space that I think a the bad actors you know will use uh, you know so I think they will leverage it um, to you know create and to you know propagate really high quality you know phishing emails or phishing attempts for example um, but I don't think necessarily it's quite ready for prime time with regards to being in the core of the cybersecurity you know stack if you will now I, I think that'll evolve over time uh, and I think companies that are smart about this will will find ways to leverage generative AI in areas of cybersecurity or their outcomes to the customer that are not in kind of the, the, the mainstream of the outcomes that they're promising. Uh, but I think we'll probably also see some that, you know, take a leap a little bit too far and the outcome will be uh, that there'll be an, an incident or, a, or an issue that may arise with their end user. So I think that brings me to the second big takeaway of our of our you know event and discussion with practitioners and, and experts, and and since the acquisition of Tetra Defense, you've got a, a wider capability and observation space. But the consensus was that prior to ChatGPT being introduced, the, the the technology vendors sort of had the advantage with AI. That sort of flipped. That initially now post you know, the AI heard around the world that, that attackers maybe have a, a near-term advantage. It sounds like you would, you would agree with that, at least in the near term. Yeah, absolutely. In the near term, uh, I would absolutely agree with that. You know, the uh, average employee is still the number one attack vector and the manner in which a lot of those bad actors are getting in and getting to information that's really critical is, is via, you know, phishing or business email compromise. And, um, a really well written, really well articulated, really relevant um, phishing email uh, is a is a very um, you know strong tactic for those bad actors to use to get into the environment. And ChatGPT just made it that much easier. Uh, and on the on the defensive side, uh, as we just talked about, um, you know you're still going to be leveraging AI, machine learning, and kind of building out a security operation to protect those customers. Uh, but I think the benefit uh, to the bad actors uh, outweighs the defense mechanism you know by the vendor or the, the the end user have you been able to discern a quantifiable improvement in phishing emails I, i'm not sure it's quantifiable uh numerically but certainly and i'm, I'm guessing you have seen this as well um they have uh, improved in not only the manner in which they're written, but the context is is very strong, right? Yeah. They're they're scouring the internet, especially for folks uh, that have a profile or that have uh, more publicly facing, you know, material, and that just makes that content that much more robust, and it makes it that much harder uh, to weed through what is what is real and not real. Now there are still some very obvious ways to uh, protect against that. You know, have a security operation that. Uh, that makes sense, make sure you understand who the sender is, like all the stuff that you would typically look at in the fish, but it makes it harder when the email is really well written and has strong context. Yeah, no question. Uh, um, I want to ask you about sort of the, the IPO market, the, the IPO drought. You've seen some recent action, which I'm sure you're watching. You know, Databricks did a, a, a some private sale. It got, looks like it got its value valuation back up prior to its last round. The ARM, uh, uh, S1 was quite interesting. Uh, SoftBank did an internal sale and they're actually, looks like they're pricing the, the IPO below that. So as a way to maybe tease people in and, and create demand. What are, your, what are you seeing potentially, you know, Instacart you know, is going to go, maybe Stripe, maybe Sneak, you know, another security player. Um, how are you thinking about IPO strategies? How, how has that changed? your operating model, maybe from growth to profitability, maybe you could give us some insight as to your current thinking. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, much like the majority of the market as the you know, growth environment has slowed a bit, people are paying a, you know, close attention to the bottom line. I do think what we're going to see through the, you know, the, the back end of this uh, is you're going to have a lot of large organizations growing at a healthy clip with a really strong bottom line. And I think that that's probably a positive outcome of some of the you know, macro turned down. And I think what you're going to see is that those companies will start to accelerate their growth again, but uh, in an environment with a much uh, healthier bottom line. So I, I think um, there are some really good companies out there. And I think those companies probably look um, you know, quite a bit uh, more interesting now, and especially, I think, 
as we progress forward, I think you'll start to see some of that grow growth, you know, tick back up for for at least some of them. Um, and I think you know a combination of uh, you know the activity that's been done within that uh, cohort of of businesses, uh, along with what appears to be a uh, you know improving at least uh, macroeconomic climate, uh, you're going to see some folks you know enter the market. I think it's still probably a little bit TBD on exactly how. Uh, that's going to all shake out, not just, you know, for the launch of the IPO, but also how that plays out kind of over the subsequent quarter or two. Um, and, um, you know, I think if a few of those, you know, go well, uh, that you'll see the IPO, you know, markets start to open up in a more material way here, you know, after what has been, you know, quite a quite a drought in the IPO market. So, you know, I'm, 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 you know, positive in my outlook as to the direction in which that's headed. And, you know, we'll continue as a business to keep a close eye on it. And obviously when it makes sense for, you know, Arctic Wolf, and if there's a, you know, willing dance part partner with the market, um, you know, we'll take a hard look at it as well. But right now we're really focused on building a, a strong business and executing for our customers. Yeah, and you did a convertible, um, I think a $400 million convertible. So the balance sheet presumably is, is still pre looking pretty good. That's correct. Yep, we did that uh, roughly a year ago. Do you think, I mean, I know it's situational, but do you think, I mean, given the current situation, does a company have to be break even or, you know, cash flow positive to, to, to go IPO? Is that kind of the assumption right now, the, the working assumption in the operating model? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure they have to be, you know, break even or profitable to go public. I think the window uh, post IPO with which folks have to be uh, kind of in that window is a lot shorter than it used to be. Um, you know, so I think, you know, whereas it used to be, uh, you know, maybe a year or two, I think you're going to be looking at, you know, quarters um, with regards to at least your ability uh, to move into free free cash flow positivity. So, um, you know, so I think, uh, you know, the the manner in which these businesses are run, kind of the offset against the the real growth that they're seeing, uh, and then the kind of market that they're approaching, how much Greenfield is in that market, what the opportunity is for them and the balance between, you know, going after that growth and, and you know, staking your claim to new geographies or new product sets uh, against this balance on the bottom line is going to be um, a, a top of mind for, for most folks that are looking to enter the, the public markets. And I think those that have been paying attention will be in pretty good shape uh, because they've, uh, you know, had time over the past year, year and a half to really formulate their 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 plan and execute against it. My last question for you is when I first was introduced to Arctic Wolf, I was under the impression that you guys really served almost exclusively the small and mid-sized market. I think there's still some of that sort of latent DNA associated with your brand. But when I first interviewed you, Nick, you told me, no, Dave, that's not true. We're actually moving up market. And so when I go to all these events now, you know, whether it's, uh, I've seen you at Reinforce, obviously saw you at RSA, I'll go by your booth, talk to your salespeople, see what they say, because salespeople love to talk. And it seems like you actually are moving, you know, up market, you're having some good success there. It seems like the repeatability of the business, I'm sure you measure your NRR, you know, seems to be going in that right direction. Of course, then when I talk to the GSIs, they sort of poo poo Arctic Wolf, you know, the big, you know, big giant firms. Um, give us the update on your, your target markets and the success that you're having, not only in SMB, but in what you call enterprise. Yeah, so, you know, we continue to serve and work with uh, customers kind of all throughout what I would call the SMB mid-market small enterprise, but we've also made significant traction uh, in the true enterprise and, and even into the large enterprise with, you know, the Fortune 500 accounts. I wouldn't say that, uh, we target the, you know, Fortune 500. I think there are specific, you know, instances where that really makes sense. Uh, but we certainly have seen an uptick in our ability to work with and engage with, you know, larger organizations than certainly that we were engaging with, you know, a, a few years ago. And I think that's just, again, um, a, a function of the way in which the market has unfolded. It's gotten more and more complex. And I think for the uh, normal manufacturer or financial institution or healthcare organization, even if they are of, of size, you know, building out a fully staffed security operation with all that's involved technologically or through, uh, you know, the, the human aspect of that build out uh, is just not, 
you know, their, their swim lane and they're looking for a trusted partner to help them build out, you know, the entirety of their security operation. And, and, and that's why, you know, we've kind of built out our operation uh, to ensure that we can deliver uh, on that promise of a security operation. I think security operations is going to end up being one of the largest, if not the largest uh, overall market within cybersecurity. Uh, and as a result of kind of some of those trends and some of the way in which we've built the business over the last few years, you know, over half of our business, uh, it, at least from a spend, you know, uh, perspective would be viewed as, you know, enterprise customers. And that's continuing to trend up quarter over quarter. So, um, so I think that perception is one uh, that was built, you know, on the onset of the company in the first few years of the manner in which we attack the market. I think that was due to the way in which the market was built at the time. I think the market itself has changed and Arctic Wolf has evolved quite a bit. And therefore we're seeing some good traction in, in larger customers. Yeah, and history of IT shows it's easier to go from small to, to, to large than it is the other way around. So Nick, uh, congratulations on all your success so far. I know you got a lot of work to do, but really appreciate your time. Uh, and thanks for spending some time on theCUBE. You got it, thanks for having me. All right, you're very welcome. All right, and thank you for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Conversation. We'll see you next time.